to my talk about API ops. Uh, we will see what API ops, API ops will be. So I'm Daniel Coates and I'm working for Codecentric here in Germany. So I'm a senior solutions architect. Uh, sometimes I'm called API expert at customers or a uh, customer at the moment calls me API evangelist. Um, I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn. So, and you can find me on the Codecentric blog where I post a lot and even on, in the software or our magazine. So you will find some way. So this is what we normally see when we yeah talk or think about something like ops. Yeah? There is continuous de deployment, DevOps, all the things around. So everything is, I would say, buzzwords. And in this talk, we don't do any buzzword bingo anymore. So because it's really settled down what we will do. So API ops is just, uh, yeah. A, a word I created or somebody else created a long time ago. So we will, we will just, just see what it really means. So, but before we really go deeper into it, we have to think about a certain type of thing when we think about DevOps. So everybody is talking about doing DevOps all the time. So we do DevOps, but what do we do within DevOps? When I talk with customers all the time and, and, and we, we have a conversation about DevOps, they always say, we want to automate everything, but that's not really DevOps. So we need something to, to get more closely to, to the term of DevOps. And this is why um, this CALMS model steps in. And CALMS is something about collaboration, automation, lean uh, principles and processes, measurement, and sharing. What I do now with you is sharing. What we do in the whole context now is talking about automation. And in this concept of automation, we will collaborate all the time with other people. And hopefully we do lean principles and lean processes so that we use Agile. Maybe we, we do just a Kanban and something around, but this is not type of the talk actually I'm doing. so. It is just around lean principles and processes, what we see in the, also in the future. So this is what it's all about. And when you do DevOps, sometimes you have to measure things, but, but this is not something we do in this talk. So we don't talk about, uh, about mean time and all the things, but it's something that's really important. And the most important thing is sharing. So we have to share a lot to get all the information to, to all the people doing DevOps in the DevOps team. And when we think of APIs, the first thing that we will do and think about is API first. It's really important to think about at, of APIs at first. So it means that a contract means everything to us. So we don't talk about the implementation in the back end or something like that. We only talk about the API the implementation upfront to the consumer. So we need something that we have to design. So we talk about API design. Normally you find nowadays something called API design first, which in my opinion is also a buzzword because it's just uh, dealing with, with the concept of tools that are around and to, be, to place them in better to say, okay, I need to do my API design first but it's always capable to just talk about API first. And when we talk about APIs, we need a certain type of language or a specification. So when we talk about REST, we normally switch over to open API. When we talk about asynchronous APIs, we normally now switch to async API, which is quite new in, in, the, in the field. So this is something which evolves from the open API spec. So we see on the, on the left side, we have this open API spec and we will now step deeper into it because the open API spec is what we need to, to do API, own API ops actually. So we just have a little look at an open API example. So we see that, the, that we have a service called news. So we get some news when we just focus on the request and there are coming some articles as an array back to us. So we see the body, it's an array, and we, we always can also can see an response example. So this is really important to get an opinion about what we are now doing. 
and to just um, give a give a quick example this is not um, a typical swagger ui here i used uh, the new stoplight elements actually to uh, present this api for this talk so when we step deeper into the specifications we learn that there are versions of specifications the newest version of open api open api spec is 3.1 which is quite new so we see when we look in the at the open uh, at the github repository we see that seven months ago that the release was done of uh, 3.1 and the latest 3.0 is 3.03 so this is the the i think the stablest release actually for for the open api specification because i say stables release regarding to tools that are able to work with open api specifications when you look at the open api dot tools website you will see that there is a lot of tooling around and thanks to the guys who who maintain the the, the, the website we are able to to learn what specification version is supported by the tools and I will not go down deeper, so we, we will see that 3.1 is not really supported by many tools at all at the moment. So this is what you can see after the talk, so that there is no real yeah, support for the 3.1 version of the Open API specification. And I talked about tooling, so there is a lot of tools we uh, will look at it when we think about an API ops. First of all, we need something to place the open API specification into. So we don't want to do version control, so we take Git. Maybe we choose some kind of Git flow to work around with the specifications. And we do not direct commits to the main branch because normally the main branch is something we, we get into production. And every change to the specification and the pipeline has to be a pull request. So this is what we really need to use Git here at, at the moment. So this is what I say, uh, uh, some kind of Git flow and we are able to um, change the specification or the pipelines by just using a pull request actually. So when we see that we have Git, we need some developer setup. And this developer setup is really a complex one because we have a big market of EDEs and editors at the moment. And this is not what we really step further into, into more and more. So we say, you can use an editor or you can use an IDE. So it depends on your own. There is no good or bad. Sometimes an EDE or an editor will help you more. Sometimes it will not. It really depends on certain other aspects. So we will step deeper into it and say, okay, when we look at an API and a specification of an API, we need to be, uh, we need to know that it is valid. So we need some local validation for it. And this is a good uh, thing to get into the way using Spectral. Spectral is an open source tool by Stoplight where we are able to yeah, validate and lint our specifications we built. There are a lot of um, add-ons available for Spectral, even for the Visual Studio Code, where you are able to use Spectral within your normal workflow and really see the linter looking at your specification and give you a lot of tips actually to see what, what is an error or maybe there is there's a warning or something like that because open api specs can be really complex and sometimes i think also really complicated when when you look deeper into it and not use something uh, generators um, actually produced for you so we see that we when we install spectral why an NPM, we see that actually by detecting the, the open API specification, there are no results actually that were put into. So, 
And the other actual aspect is for, for using Spectral is to, that you can build rule sets on your own. You are able to use the rule sets. So with this rule sets, you are able to evolve an API governance actually around the specifications. So we use, in this case, the normal open API spec 3.0, and we extend this with some sort of spectral things to, to really do linting and, and the validation, and recreated a new rule and say, OK, tags have or well, tags have uh, tags need a description actually. So this is what spectral does in, in, in the background is looking at the specification and really looking into the description of tags. So if there is a description missing for a tag, it will re remind you and say, okay, a description is missing at the moment. So this is what we can do with this root set. We really can build up a governance on our own regarding to the governance rules we have for the for yeah for the company actually or the or the organization. So when we look deeper into it and say, okay, we we did the validation, and what we now like to do is to test the API specification. We need some local mocking, and this is where something like Prism or API Sprout or something like that comes into place, and we are able to mock the Open API specification. And this is also, again, quite easy just to install a tool, use this mock. And now the specification is available behind the given address. And using a mock is quite interesting to do some local testing with it. Normally, when we think about API specification, the thing we could do is unit testing. So. You can create a test suite based directly on the spec. And this is what, what can easily be done by a behavior-driven framework. You can take Karate or something like that and, and use this and to build the test suites on, on your own. But this could be quite annoying over the time because you, you have to use a lot of time building up the test suite and, and uh, have a look at it and say, OK, ah, I have this test suite. And, I have to change something, and you always have to do a lot of work to invest in your test suites. So it might be interesting to look at Postman collections. So a lot of people, a lot of us, are using Postman actually to use it for you know, requesting APIs, testing APIs. And Postman is also able to build up collections. And with these collections, we are able to build up test suites. And this can be done quite easily with um, a new library called Portman. It comes from API DAC, and it's just, again, a um, JavaScript framework. And uh, we are able to, to, again, install it. And now we can combine it with Prism and use it use the, and really test against the mock server. So when we look at the, at the second, um, line, we see that we build up a, a mock server. And in the same uh, moment, we, we also start Portman using the local specification. And there is, a sp there is this minus n parameter, which means we're doing Newman testing. So when we you want to use Postman, we have to use Newman for the CICD pipelines. And this is what we use also here in this little demo um, on just the local local machine. And when we do this, sorry, we get this feedback from Portman. So he finds the local path. He, he talks about a local config, a Postman config. And we are now able to really even also upload something to Postman or something like that. And, and just place the specification directly at Postman when we use Postman. What we do now is that we just uh, use Newman and do the CICD testing against Newman, actually. And we see that the tests that were created 
on the fly by just scanning the open API specification, looking for examples and so on. And so the Portman is able to really test the API. A normal test is just to test against the status code of 200 or 2XX and then look at the content type and response if it is a JSON body. And we have a, a third test that just tests if the schema is valid. But all the tests run through and so our specification is tested. And what we do here locally, we will as a little uh, look into the future also do on a CI CD pipeline. So this is what is really need to do testing within an API spec. But when we just think about unit tests for APIs, it's really not the best testing. So we have to think about load tests. But load tests can be quite complex. We have smoke tests where we just give a short iteration against the API spec and say, okay, we do one request and we, we, we um, examine what is happening with the API. Then we can do a quite complex load test and then we can do stress tests and in the end we can also do soak tests. So soak tests means that we um, use the API for a short time and the second run we use it for a really long time and see what happens with the API specification or the API that we are testing against. And that we now have Postman, we are again able to create K6 tests from Postman because K6 is that low testing tool we will use here. And there's another library again of the, what we can find on NPM where we can just transform a Postman collection to a K6 test. K6 tests are just uh, JavaScript tests who are created with what about by using this little tool. With this K6 test, we just can start it quite easily by just running the, 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 the test file. We are able to test or do a little smoke test, actually. We just use one virtual user. This is why we have a YU in there. And we just test against it and see what happens with the data, what is received. Is, is there something received? So if the backend is available and so on. So this is what we do within testing against K6, actually. So this is what we have on our tooling side. So when we now move forward, we have to move back to the open, I, open API specification to, to look at certain type of different things. Normally, you have a discussion about YAML and JSON. In my opinion, YAML is more human readable. JSON is the more machine readable. And there is another thing parsing of JSON is quite faster. So when you have to parse an, a YAML file, it's really complicated for the parser and it costs a lot of time. And it could happen that sometimes the parser can't handle a lot of YAML files actually. So it is maybe a good option to convert the YAML files to JSON for things regarding on uh, code pipeline. So when we do CI, CD, it might be a good choice to just use the JSON notation for this. And using another tool, again, we are doing a lot of tooling, actually, a lot of open source tooling. It's just easy to con um, yeah, con convert the YAML data to, to JSON, actually. So now what we would like to look is the structure of an open API. And there is a tool available from Handy, API Handyman who built it a long, a long time ago. And it is really good to see how the structure of an API specification, even for open API 3.0, 
really looks like. So we have a lot of things. We have this info, we, we, we talk about servers, then is the part where we have the path. Then are the components, the things we can really reuse. We'll see that later, what happens. We have a, yeah, a, a part of security, we, we talk about tacking and we have external tools. And this is what we will My slides and got away. Sorry for that. I have to get up the slides again. But this is not. This is what we, we saw the structure of um, the, the open API map of any man. So you can use the, the URL to see what the structure of an API or of an API specification exists actually. So the interesting thing about this API specification is that we are able to reuse things. So we have to so we are able to split up the structure, which leads in some cases to a design library where other people are able to, to use our specification, actually. So we have a possibility of a hard splitting, where we say, okay, one file per object, or to, to make it more and more complex, an, an object could be even just a response. So that for every response, we have a certain type of file. Or the soft side is that we just look at the size of the whole document and all the objects themselves and do a, a, some type of soft splitting that we are able to really shrink this, uh, the, the, the size of the open API specification of the, of the global document actually. And to, to do this, we are able to, to use references and they step in with the ref tag actually and we are able to use local references. We are we also can use remote references and we can use references by URL. So that parts of our schema of our open API spec could lie somewhere else. So when we have a big repository, we can really split off the parts of an open, open API specification into different repositories actually. So, but what will happen when we have to use this split open API specification again? Then we have, then we need something that uh, we are able to rebundle things to one file again. So this is where a really old tool comes in, like Swagger uh, Swagger CLE, and with Swagger CLE we are able to bundle the referenced. Specif uh, specification documents again to one great specification or big specification. So with this tooling around, we are able to really split off the specification to make it more readable, to, to make it to get a better understanding about the open API specification. And within a, a step of the CI CD pipeline, we are able to bundle the YAML file again, or the, the, the JSON file again, to, to just get the whole information that is needed to do some, to, to, the, to do the next steps with the specification. So when we just move on, we see that there was something on this open API map, which is called open API extensions or X objects where we can handle our own or vendor specific needs. So there are a lot of vendors actually in the market who have this special, this open API extensions 
for the use of a gateway or some other in infrastructure elements. So this is quite interesting to see that you are able to extend the open AI specification in a quite an easy way. So when we are at customers and uh, do projects with customers, we use the open API extensions a lot because here we are able to rebuild structures, give uh, the specification organizational form again and, and all the things around so that we are not able to do with the standard set for the open API specification. When, with these uh, open API extensions, we are able to place the information at the root level at the in the info box uh, and we can place this directly at parse at operations parameters at, at responses tags and even in security schemes we can deliver more vendor needs or our own specification needs so when we do think a, bit, a little bit further when we, we heard about the, the open API extensions, we see there is the idea of configuration as code. So we, we learn when we look at cloud vendors that there's something like AWS Cloud Formation, AWS CDK, Azure ARM templates, and we also have something which uh, has a more agnostic approach like Pulumi or Terraform, you can name a lot of it. So I, I just put down some, some notes to it. And when we look at cloud formation, it's quite interesting to see how easy it becomes when we use an open API spec to get information directly for this process of using cloud formation. So when we look at the specification, we have to scroll a little bit down, we find this extension tag called X Amazon API gateway integrations, which means that we are able to place the part of the integration for the API. So with this type of mock, the AWS gate API gateway knows that we want a mock behind the gateway to give the information back for the for the endpoint because the backend is not available so far. This is quite interesting step to do because now we are able to use the information we need for the infrastructure directly into the open API specification. And with this information, we are able to do a lot more smoother things regarding CI CD pipelines in the context of APIs. And in the second step for cloud formation, we need uh, as, as free bucket for placing the open API specification in, in the AWS stack. And this is the whole cloud um, formation AWS API gateway stack we just built up and see that is that we are able to, to do a deployment with the information living in this bucket so we just rely on the on the on the body for for the s3 location and say okay there is this open api specification take it there are all the information you need to build the more informations you you need to to um really yeah configure the gateway actually and this is one of the things we see a lot now uh, in in the in the market of api gateways and there are other gateway vendors, for example, Kong and, and Pike, who use similar tools, but really build on their own. So when we look at Kong, we have DAC, where we are able to um, load and reload and validate configurations for, for the gateway and, and for, the, for the whole process. And this is similar to Tyke Sync, where we are also able to get information from the open API specification and put it into the configuration for, for TIG actually. So with this, we are now able to build up deployable infrastructure based on specifications. And with this ideas, we are able to deploy gateways, portals, hubs, and even registries so that, that all the information is at one place, we, we use the configuration as code uh, paradigm and, and really bring it to the point where it's 
good and, and needed to really evolve the deployable infrastructure used by an API. And this brings us to the um, transformation to automation within a CI CD pipeline, where we learned that we need API first, we need to have a Git process, the um, API specification should be well structured and formed. We should think about automated validation, automated testing, and automated deploying of relevant infrastructure so that we bring all the stuff with us to really do a good process within an API specification handling so that we are really able to bring the API to, to the consumer and give us all, as, as a producer, all the information to build up the whole stack, actually. And when we look more into it, it's a really, yeah, it's, it's, it's a classical end-to-end -end automation that we have a design phase where we looked at the local side where we did all the linting, the testing, the enforcement. Um, on, on success, we do, we do just uh, the pull request into, into the source control. And within the source control, or starting from source control, there's also the CI CD pipeline, where we have pipelines that are able to do the PR, merge it when it all really happens, like linting, testing, policy enforcement. And if that ever comes up, the pull request will not be merged. And on success after the merge, when we are all on this main branch, we are able to really deploy things in front of the gateway for a portal and so on. So we are really able to, to do the steps with a design phase, with an automation phase for CI CD. And we also will have an automated deployment, which brings a whole lot of speed and also quality within the design of an API or in the processes regarding to API design and implementation. But a good question could be, do we really need an own fr framework for this? So when we look at the tools I used up front and before, um, they're all command line interfaces. So I, in my opinion, actually, there's no need to really build up our own framework and, and build something for this because with this uh, command line tools and uh, the way nowadays the pipelines and, and um, all the Azure DevOps and GitLabs and so on wor really work, it's not, not a need to build up a new framework. A framework could be a good uh, thing to talk about when you use a lot of uh, REST APIs to deploy something and, and uh, build build up something so that there is a lot of REST APIs needed and we just want to facade around it and say, OK, it is not needed that we know every type of um, yeah, API for this, that we have an administration API and, and it, it works like in this way. So in the, there, we should use a facade, actually. But you should see that we missed some parts, actually. So we didn't talk about building SDKs. This is something which comes in a second step. We must at first build the API specification. And when we use portals, normally we have the possibility to um, just have a sandbox so that the customer or the consumer is able to test against the sandbox. SDKs, in my opinion, are the next step. When we do a good thing with the API portal, portal we are able to set up SDKs. There, and there are a lot of generators actually available who bring us these type of SDKs. But you have to be always careful because you have to look at the uh, specification number and so on. So it's really, really interesting to see what comes up there in the next place. And we didn't really thought about security. All the things we did at this talk are out of the security context, because we don't talk about the OSAP uh, API top 10 or security best practices. So this is when we sh should move this API ops to uh, API sec ops. 
when, when we when we talk about this. But uh, normally this is this is another talk because API security is quite complex and and can be sometimes quite annoying when you don't know uh, good tools to test something or really think about uh, what's the best way to to really secure your API. And we didn't even talk about policies and even policy as code. So something like OPA was not in this uh, open API, uh, in this in this API ops uh, setup. And there's another tool available from, um, from HashiCorp Sentinel. So that is not really that we looked at policies or policy as code, because this is another, I think, difficult field where we have to step in and learn a lot about it. There are a lot of tools actually around. There are a lot of um, API gateways that are able to handle OPA and, and uh, also uh, Sentinel at the moment, but it's another step. So really bringing in policies as code is also quite a complex thing. So this is what, what comes in a third step. When we did the, the, in the security or it's by the security when we move more into the, the field to say, okay, I don't want the key cloak installed to also think about policies. This is something I will do with OPA to really use this uh, declarative tile of uh, policies and, and use these policies to, to really evolve um, the, the development of APIs, actually. So thank you for your time and listening to my talk.